Hi, welcome back to the channel and to the third of our history walks between the Negresco Hotel in Nice and the Chapel Saint Hospice on Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. Today we're going to make the journey from here up to the Fort de Montalbon then we're going to wind our way down the ancient cart track into Villefranche itself. Along the way we're going to discover the story of the bohemian musician who lived in this crazy villa for 40 years. We're going to take a drone flight around the Fort de Montalbon and over at Sir Elton John's villa. We're going to discover why the Americans have had such a great influence on Villefranche over the years and we can discover what happened when Sir Noel Coward brought Greta Garbo to the Cocteau Chapel. So lace up your boots. Let's get going. So our journey begins today here at the viewing platform overlooking the Baie des Anges uh, with Nice Port in the background. But I haven't brought you here for the view well, certainly not this view, because I brought you here to see this incredible villa. This is Villa Beausite. It was one of the great Belle Epoque follies. It was built in 1870, but then in 1948, this villa is purchased by the woman who would live in it to the end of her life, a woman called Giselle Tissier. And hers is an incredible story. Her relationship with Nice began in the 1920s when she met and married a man called Paul Tissier and together they were invited to stage a series of fantastic artistic parties in the town and they staged this thing which attracted uh, celebrities and the wealthy from all over the world to come to the Hotel Rule where they would come to what I think were called Fête des Arts, which I think today would be a bit like a sort of French Met Ball, something like that. Um, but these became huge successes. Sadly, Paul Tissier dies in 1926 uh, and it's then that Giselle, I think, gets the idea that she will one day return to Nice. But she doesn't manage this, of course, until after the war in 1948, when she buys this villa. And into it, she moves her vast collection of musical instruments. A grand piano, I think there were 15 harps, 27 violins, but it's actually said that there was a train of 10 carriages was needed to actually bring all her equipment and her gear and her furniture and her musical instruments into this villa. And she lives here for the rest of her life until she dies in 1988. And during that time, she composes, I think, over 400 works of music. But sadly, as the years go on, her money dwindles. And by the time we get to the uh, mid 80s, the place is really falling apart. But interestingly, in the last year of her life, she allows the band The Cure to come over from Crawley, England and record their video here. Uh, I can't show you for copyright reasons uh, the video, but these are some photos of, uh, of what it looked like then. So let's get moving on our walk now and head up towards the Fort de Montalbon. So if we head over the crossing, there's a rather good little path up here. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, look at that. That's phenomenal. That is, um, that is the French Red Arrows. Um, uh, I didn't know they were coming today. It's quite weird. The, 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 the reason they've come is to um, to celebrate the 75th anniversary of, uh, of a very famous French book called The Petit Prince, The Little Prince, which was written by a, um, an early aviator. I'm gonna carry on up here along this uh, road to the Fort de Montalbon. And once you start to get into the actual forest itself, you start to get some really clear views down to the Med. Um, and you begin to see why so many people 
wanted to buy land in this little area at the turn of the uh, 20th century and build their little piece of Eden. And as we come around this corner, it's a bit that never fails to take my breath away. It's just the most incredible view of saint jean cap Ferrar over there, Beaulieu, Villefranche. Beyond that, you can see Es, Es Village up in the hills. And then beyond that, right the way towards Monaco. And in the distance, Italy sits in the haze. Gino de Campo awaits. Once you get to here, where the bus stop is for the Chemin de Fort, the road divides in two. So if you go down here, you'll get a fantastic view of Nice. And then if you turn right, you'll head up towards Sir Elton's villa and the Fort de Montalban. And over here, this little path, that takes you right down to Villefranche. See, there's a handy little map showing you all the routes, but it's also showing you the parcours sportif, because there is a sort of rand oxygen course here where you can run around and do various different exercises. There's different, uh, different things built at different points. Uh, there's also a kind of complete outdoor gym, which again was incredibly useful when the gyms were closed here for seven months. And uh, coming up here on your left-hand side, as all good tour guides say, is the villa of Sir Elton John. From that noise, it sounds like he's got the gardeners in. He's got quite a lot of gardeners, because he's got quite a lot of garden. his tennis court. I once heard him knocking up with the Janet Street Porter. So there's the gates to Elton's. I've not been invited yet, but I think after this video I'm, I'm probably definitely due an invite. And there up ahead of us in the distance is the Fort de Montalbon. I thought rather than try and describe the Fort de Montalbon to you, I'd send the drone up. Q drone. Sadly, you can't actually go inside it. There's a couple of times a year when they have sort of heritage days when they do actually open it up. Um, it was used in that TV show, Riviera. I can't say I've watched a lot of it, but um, uh, apparently it was used in Riviera. Um, there, was a, there was a sort of pretend art exhibition up here in it. Doubtless they all blew up and there was a helicopter crash and then somebody had sex. That kind of show. But if you come over here, you will get another incredible view of Nice. So there you go. There is the whole of Nice laid out and the Esteril mountains behind. Still no snow on them, but it'll be coming. But this is why it's such an incredible place to walk to here because you literally can see 
on a clear day all the way down towards Antibes and Cannes and the other way all the way to Italy. And down there you can just make out the left hand side of the image the, uh, the citadel of Villefranche which I say was linked up to the fort up here and the ancient Dars of Villefranche, the ancient harbour which is still a very much a working harbour uh, and it's where the Oceanological Institute is, which is one of the major research facilities in the whole of France for uh, climate change and that kind of thing in terms of water temperature. Um, but the Dars, very lovely place to go and have lunch. Little restaurants there, the Caudry or the Joyeuse Baleine or the uh, Tranquette. Um, and uh, the Dars has been there since I think about 1750, so it's almost as long as me. You get a really terrific view from up here of the Bay of Villefranche and Villefranche itself down there, which is, of course, where we're going to be heading on the second uh, second part of this episode, down into the medieval village of Villefranche. Doesn't look so medieval from up here, does it? But trust me, it is. Now, there are various ways you can get back down into Villefranche. Um, there's this way which takes you via the Col de Villefranche, um, takes you via the Boulanger which is quite handy because there's quite good sandwiches in there. Uh, and then there's the other way which is the, the, the path I showed you earlier. But there is also, well, it's a semi-secret route. It took me a long time to discover it. Um, I was very excited when I did discover it. Uh, but I think it's probably what was the original donkey track that brought you up here. Go into the woods, not something I'm used to doing. Definitely not a route to take this if you're, uh, if you're hard of walking. It's a little bit lumpen and, and uh, well you could slip and uh, do yourself some damage and fall on a stick or something. It might be quite painful. Um, this old park area, very popular with families, joggers, exercisers, doggers. Did I say doggers? <laughs> uh, uh, échangiste. There's a few échangistes. Uh, and uh, quite a few gay échangistes, very, very popular with as well. And just round this corner is what I think would have originally been the old... Uh, the old gate, whether it was a toll gate or whether it was a security point, I don't know, but I think this was the gate to the fort. Many years ago, somebody up here must have uh, spent quite a lot of time carving um, a very old sort of tree stump into a rather magnificent phallus, um, which, which I did take a picture of, but it was with a very early iPhone, so it might be a bit dodgy. But if I can find it, I'll put it up. Uh, otherwise, you'll just have to imagine this, this carving. So once you've clambered down that bit, you come to a sort of uh, a very narrow passage. And uh, just be a bit careful down here. There's a rather lovely farmstead, one of the sort of last remaining farmsteads around here on the left hand side. They used to have a tortoise. This... There's my watch. Thanks watch. Um, yeah, they used to have a rather lovely tortoise that Halloween was very keen on. Um, but I think the, uh, the old lady farmer doesn't seem to do any farming anymore. It's amazing to think that even sort of 60, 70 years ago, the hills up above here that are now covered in villas and apartment blocks and quite a lot of second homes were actually just farmland. So we'll take a left here down the first set of steps. Ooh, glad it's not too near Halloween because it's getting quite spooky down here. down here is one of my favourite buildings in Villefranche. It's the old builder's yard, which up until relatively recently was still um, still in operation. But um, I think I heard it's, uh, it's finally 
gone the way of all builder's yards. I've always thought it really sad that uh, we list buildings, but we never list signage. There doesn't seem to be, um, that I know of anyway, any, any law that means you can preserve a sign. And the amount of times you see a wonderful bit of signage being covered over with some horrible screen printing or some modern monstrosity. Um, and yet to me, signage is sort of so evocative of an era, of a time, uh, that it's every bit as important as, what, as the, the bricks and the mortar and the architecture, uh, if we're talking history. Anyway, a bit of social comment for you there. Never realised, but hasn't this lady got very plump bottom cheeks? They're very, very good cheeks they are. Very good. And now we're alongside the Citadel. The Citadel that we, uh, I pointed out when we were right up at the Fort de Montalbon, the so let's head now down into the village of Villefranche itself and uh, I'm going to tell you why America has had such an influence on this town, why there are still Independence Day celebrations um, and why in 1960 44% of all the marriages that were consecrated in the church here were between a French lady and an American man. When we get to the bottom here, we'll come to the main street of Villefranche, Rue Palou, which used to contain butchers and bakers and candlestick makers and cobblers. Uh, now it's, uh, well, there are many more tourist shops, let's put it that way, but there are still supermarkets and there are still uh, one traditional bar. Uh, and it's a bar that survives from the days of the Sixth Fleet been here, which were based here uh, right up until 1968, from the time of the Second World War right up to 1968 when de Gaulle pulled France out of NATO. Sebastian's had a new hairdo and he's been, he's been desperate for us to show it on the channel. So if you, uh, if you want to come somewhere very authentic, uh, pop into La Far because there are still mementos from the days of when the Sixth Fleet uh, came to Villefranche. So yeah, it's hard to believe that there was a time when this street alone had 13 bars, 13, one, three, uh, that were used by the, uh, the US sailors. So you'd have come down here of an evening and you'd have heard Nat King Cole and you'd have heard Elvis Presley. And uh, I think you'd have probably seen some quite raucous behavior. Although apparently they were, uh, they were kept under a very tight watch by their uh, seniors. But sailors on shore leave, well, they're sailors on shore leave, aren't they? But now, let's uh, go down to the seafront. I at the oldest street in Villefranche. This street dates back to the 13th century. Yeah, let's head down towards the seafront and to the famous Cocteau Chapel, where we're going to end our um, walk today. But before we end it, we're going to discover the story of what happened when Noel Coward brought, of all people, Greta Garbo to Villefranche to see the Cocteau Chapel. just over here opposite the uh, the Welcome Hotel which was where Cocteau spent much of his time when he was in Villefranche sat on one of their balconies up there he said it was like uh, it was like being at the opera watching watching the world go by and no doubt watching the sailors bring the catch in um, but this is where they have placed Cocteau's bust and uh, when you read the plaque that's on the the statue, it says, when I think of Villefranche, I think of my youth. 
may it never change. But let's pop around here now and just look at the outside of the gorgeous Cocteau Chapel, which uh, Cocteau decorated in, I think, about 1953. It was a sort of deconsecrated uh, chapel, and for many years it had been used actually just by the sailors to store their nets. And Cocteau came up with the idea of of painting it inside and doing some uh, some of his unique decoration. Uh, and I have to say, the sailors, they weren't that pleased about the idea because, uh, well, they quite like their nets in. And also, I'm not sure they totally appreciated Cocteau's aesthetic. But uh, at the time, Cocteau was, uh, was fantastically keen and uh, friendly with an actor who became very, very famous, Jean Marais. Uh, who was very, very good looking. And uh, when Noel Coward was invited to a sort of private view of the chapel, he, he brought Greta Garbo. And uh, they had a look round, and as they're strolling out back into the street here in Villefranche, Coward turned to Garbo and he said, oh, marvellous, absolutely marvellous. But I'd no idea that so many of the disciples looked like John Murray. So that brings us to the end of our third leg of our walk to the Chapelle Saint Hospice on Saint Jean Cap Ferrat. Next time we're going to go from here in Villefranche, right the way round into Beaulieu and on to Saint Jean Cap Ferrat itself. Hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please, please, please give us a like, give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell to receive notifications. Won't cost you a penny. It makes a huge difference to the uh, algorithm and uh, I sleep better. See you on the next one. Take care. Bye.